when I was a lad back in the 80s, when I was buying my first car, turbos meant you had a performance car. The special cars had turbos. In TV shows, the turbo meant the car could leap up into the air and do amazing feats. So it was a bit of a disappointment when I actually got a turbocharged car. But you can still have a lot of fun with the turbo. The thing is, nowadays, most cars come with turbos. We've discussed why manufacturers are pushing people over to turbocharged engines in another video. But in this video, we're going to look at eight areas that people often fall down on when it comes to prolonging the life of a turbo. There's things that we can do inadvertently that damage our turbocharged engine. Now, I've done a video like this in the past, and I know a lot of other YouTubers have copied the content we've got in that older video, but that older video is out of date. Things have moved on considerably. It was based on quite an old article. So this video is gonna bring us up to date and look at eight areas that we need to be aware of when driving a turbocharged car. And I'm also gonna look at the likelihood of this problem on a modern engine, a modern turbocharged engine. So we're gonna be discussing some of the changes that manufacturers have made to improve the reliability and to mitigate some of these problems that are often associated with those older turbocharged engines. One of the comments from one of our viewers, back in the 80s, he bought an MG Metro Turbo. If you don't know, look it up. They're good fun cars, tiny, probably rusted away now, but they were good fun. They had a decent amount of power and you could really enjoy them. So the instructions said that you should leave the car idling for 15 seconds before you drive it and you should let it idle for 15 seconds after you've driven it to allow the turbo and the oil and everything in the car to warm up or cool down appropriately. And the manual actually said, if you don't do that, you'll damage the turbocharger. Does this advice apply to modern cars? Well, we've discussed cold starts and cold start problems, and there's certainly an element of additional wear and tear that goes on in a cold engine. And the oil needs to get up to grade. The turbocharger has fairly fast spinning components inside it, so oil delivery and oil viscosity is critical. You don't really want to be pushing the turbo too hard in those first 15 to 30 seconds, and and certainly after a spirited run. But synthetic oils have come a long way. They can protect engines from much lower temperatures. Manufacturers have also moved on. So your coolant circuit, and in some cases the oil flow, will also continue after you shut the engine off. In these modern engines, a lot of protection has gone in to mitigate the problem on those early turbos where they needed time to warm up and the oil to circulate, and they also needed time to cool down. And again, for the oil to be circulated through this spinning turbo that is slowing up. It's certainly a sensible thing to do to let the engine idle for 15 to 30 seconds, just to let the oil pressure get up and for things in the engine to start to warm up. Whether you drive ridiculously carefully for the first 15 or 20 minutes is up to you. If you want your car to last a long time, you'll be avoiding the high RPM and the red line driving until at least the oil has got up to operating temperature. So that might take 10 to 15 minutes. But generally just Go careful when you've just started your engine. If it's got a turbocharger on it, there's more components and the oil flow and oil viscosity is more critical in those engines. So just be careful. Don't be paranoid. Modern engines have gone a long way to mitigate the problems associated with those older turbos. But just by being careful, you can prolong the life of your turbocharger. Now, as a driver, think about your throttle control. Try and be progressive with the throttle control. It's not a binary pedal. It's not on or off, as a lot of drivers seem to think. With a turbocharged engine, having that progressive control on the throttle gives the turbo a little bit of a chance to spool up, to accelerate, to decelerate the blow-off valves, the diverter valves, the wastegate. They're working steadily. You're not snapping open and snapping closed. The sudden changes in pressure that you get with aggressive throttle controls can shorten the life of these components. By how much? Well, probably not loads. They're quite solidly built. Some manufacturers have put a lot of plastic in modern parts, so they're more prone to fail. But as a driver, you want to prolong the life of the turbocharger as long as possible. And just adjusting that driving style so we're not brutal, we're not on and off on the accelerator, can go a long way to mitigating potential problems that might crop up if we are not quite so careful and progressive on that throttle control.
Another area is servicing. Don't view servicing as an unnecessary expense. And if the manufacturer says 9,000 miles, you try and push it to 12,000 in order to save a little bit of money. You're not saving money doing that. You're accelerating the wear and tear on your engine. The engine oil does degrade over time. It collects all sorts of debris and other fluids. The viscosity of the oil changes over time. It's also picking up metal particles. Now, a lot of the metal particles are caught inside the oil filter but the small tiny metal particles are still having an abrasive effect inside the engine and if it gets into the turbocharger it's going to accelerate the wear and tear on the turbo itself don't skimp on your servicing make sure you use a good quality oil as recommended by the manufacturer it's not just the viscosity you're looking at i've discussed that so many times in videos you're looking at the other components in the oil and whether they were designed to run in your turbocharged engine with all of the other components that the manufacturers put in there and it's all carefully formulated and designed to protect your engine so please don't skimp on servicing and oil changes changing the service interval for a short period of time can actually extend the life of the engine there are many people out there with cars that have done ridiculous mileages and when you talk to them they've all shortened the service interval to get those ridiculous starship mileages we've got to talk about fuel quality as well we're not just talking about octane although that is an important factor the fuel supplied at most filling stations now has an ethanol component within it if you buy E10, for example, that's telling you that 10% of that fuel has ethanol in it. If you have E5, 5% of that fuel is ethanol. And in some areas, you can get E85, so 85% of the fuel is ethanol. So ethanol itself, it's not great on older engines. It can damage rubber seals and components within the engine itself. So if your engine has not been designed to use ethanol fuels, you're restricted to using E5, which is a higher octane fuel. And you won't get the benefit of the higher octane, but you won't have the detrimental effect of the ethanol. But most turbocharged engines run at higher compression. They require more protection against knock and higher octane fuel provides that it's less likely to have knock and detonation if you're not sure what those are check out the video that i did recently on knock and detonation it discusses what is going on inside the engine so you can understand that but the octane of the fuel resists knock so if you're using a low octane fuel in a high compression turbocharged engine that was designed for higher octane fuel, you're not only just going to be down on power, you're risking damage to your engine. If your engine is knocking excessively, it's going to do its best to protect itself. All the systems inside are going to detect knock and back off. But having that knock going on inside the engine is potentially causing damage to the metals inside the engine. It's causing pitting and other damage to the pistons, and that's going to accelerate the wear and tear on the engine. So please choose the fuel that is recommended for your engine. Some manufacturers have hedged their bets, really. They're recommending the 95 octane fuel, but they often run better on 97 octane fuel. Don't just go by what's on the filler cap. Try the higher octane fuel. And if the engine performance is better, you're probably better off using that higher octane fuel. It's strictly in terms of protecting the engine and getting the maximum performance from your engine. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts are on octane and how that has applied to your car. I can't be dogmatic. Every car out there is different. It's not just a matter of all cars with turbos love high octane fuel because they don't. There are some exceptions out there. Another driving thing that we need to look at is low speed pre-ignition. This happens when you're lugging. So you're driving at very low rpm by low i mean near tick over a lot of hyper milers do this thinking they're getting more fuel economy from the engine I've discussed that to death in other videos so check them out if you're interested in the merits of hyper miling but want to avoid the problems associated with lugging an engine low speed pre-ignition is often caused by the vapors building up inside the engine the oils and everything else it's a high compression engine if that ignites prematurely at these low speeds it can cause all sorts of problems and difficulties inside the engine reducing the overall lifespan of the engine again it's not going to
kill the engine and blow it up necessarily. I have seen some fairly badly damaged pistons and some engines that really did need to have a rebuild. But in the main, you're just reducing the overall life of the engine. So avoid lugging a turbocharged engine. They don't like it. And you're not saving fuel. You're not getting any benefit from lugging the engine. General maintenance, if you have a turbo engine, it really is vital to keep the air filter clean. It's sucking in a lot more air, so that filter is going to get dirty very quickly. Manufacturers have generally fitted larger filters on their turbocharged engines, so they need changing less often. They still offer a decent amount of filtration. Check as well the blow off valve on the turbocharger. So this diverts the excess pressure that builds up in a turbo when you lift off. And in most cases, it diverts it back to the intake. There are atmospheric dump valves as well that vent this out to the atmosphere. Some engines don't like that setup, but do your research, please, if you're thinking of upgrading or converting to an atmospheric dump valve. And also all of the pipes and hoses around the intercooler, if they split, you're going to be down on power. The turbocharger is going to be working too hard to supply the air that the car is expecting. So you can effectively, in some cases, overdrive a turbocharger because you've got an air leak and you won't notice it because the car's doing a good job at compensating for that lack of air by spooling up the turbo even faster. So don't ignore these splits and these problems that you get. So symptoms to look out for in your turbocharger are whining noises, squeaking noises, siren noises, a whooshing of air if that's happening anywhere in the engine bay suspect there is a split pipe it's often around the joins and if you've moved something in the engine that is commonly the area that is going to experience that leak you might also notice excessive smoke coming from the engine so again the engine is going to go a long way to run as smoothly as it can it may be dumping more air more fuel in it might be adjusting or doing its best to adjust to avoid the problem but don't ignore these problems if you've got an engine check light on get your diagnostic tool out download the error codes and work out where the problem is because these problems often escalate and get worse especially on a turbocharged engine everything's working at higher pressures higher tolerances it's more critical that your components in a turbocharged engine are working effectively than on maybe a large capacity naturally aspirated engine. If you've noticed that your car is down on power, again, that's a clue. There's potentially a problem there that you need to address. So noticing that early symptom can avoid the more expensive problems that crop up later. Mitigating problems. What have manufacturers done? Well, the engine is much more complex now. There's a lot more management. We're now dealing with a drive by wire setup where the computer is making adjustments to the throttle rather than it being directly controlled by a cable connected to the accelerator pedal. In a modern car, it's going to protect itself. If the engine is cold, if the oil hasn't circulated properly, it's going to limit the throttle movements. These sudden on off throttle motions are going to be smoothed out by the ECU nowadays, it's going to take control of that. So being an idiot driver is not as much of a problem as it used to be. Some cars also restrict the amount of RPM that you can use when the engine is cold. So until it has warmed up, you're going to be driving the car in a restricted power band. So the car has a chance to warm up and it's going to do everything it can to warm up the engine as quickly as possible. So that may mean restricting the flow of coolant around the radiator. It may mean slowing up or speeding up the flow of oil around the engine, changing the oil pressure. There's a lot of things that the modern engine can do to protect itself. And when it comes to stop start engines and the engine suddenly being switched off, we don't have to worry as much now about the oil in the turbo and the turbo getting lubrication while it spools down because with electronic oil pumps and electric water cooling systems, the pump is still driving the flow of oil to the turbocharger. So it's no longer running on that little reservoir of oil it's got, it's still getting fresh oil or fresh coolant, which can help to mitigate the temperature spikes that we used to have on older turbos where you had a mechanical water pump or a mechanical oil pump that was driven by the crank and the RPM that the engine was running at. So your modern turbocharged engine has come a long way. A lot of the things that we used to really need to be careful about on older turbocharged engines 
are just sensible precautions we can take on a modern turbocharged engine to prevent problems, to extend the life of our turbocharged engine. So we all want to avoid breakdowns and we all want our car to last as long as possible. So just adjusting our driving habits and keeping on top of these maintenance items can really extend the lifespan of our turbocharged engine. So thanks for watching. Please boot the like button. That really does help us to get out there. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. It really does help when the algorithm sees people subscribing to the channel. And I've lined this video and this playlist up for you that you should find really interesting. Thanks for watching. See you in this next video.